The legendary stories of old Hollywood offer an endless treasure trove of fascinating tidbits, out-of-this-world characters, and unforgettable tales. So keep watching for a healthy dose of intriguing trivia about the golden age of the silver screen. Up until 1934, the highest paid screenwriter was female. It's an undisputed fact that Hollywood, especially the part seated behind the camera, has historically been a mostly male-dominated industry. As such, it might come as a bit of a surprise that the most revered screenwriter of the silent era was a woman. Later on in her career, she tried her hand out as a director as well. Between 1915 and 1934, Frances Marion was the highest paid screenwriter in the U.S. From 1916 to 19, while Marion was writing exclusively for the superstar Mary Pickford, she earned an impressive $50,000 a year, which, adjusted for inflation, is about a million dollars today. Marion dabbled in directing twice in 1921 with the films The Love Light, which starred Mary Pickford, and Just Around the Corner. Although her directing career never really got off the ground, she continued to write screenplays until the 1940s. Marion felt a deep and unwavering connection with the industry, and its star players like Pickford and Irving Thalberg absolutely adored her. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to Facts First for more. And stay tuned to learn the tragic fate of Rudolph Valentino, one of Hollywood's most beloved silent film stars. A full-color motion picture hit theaters in 1918, but it's since been lost to history. There's a bit of a debate as to whether Cupid Angling was the world's first color feature film, but seeing as how it was released in 1918, a full 20 years before the momentous Technicolor adventures of Robin Hood, it's definitely among the first. The film was shot in Douglas Natural Color, a process developed by film producer Leon Douglas. This system would alternate red-orange dyed and green-blue dyed frames to give watchers a viewing experience that incorporated naturalistic colors. There were quite a few attempts to bring color film technology to theaters in the early years of cinema. In the 1920s, Technicolor came up with a two-step process that brought the industry a bit closer to the celebrated three-color process utilized in movies like The Wizard of Oz, Robin Hood, and Gone with the Wind. Sadly, no prints of Cupid angling are known to be in existence. Rudolph Valentino's death stirred up much chaos. Although his career was relatively short-lived, silent film star Rudolph Valentino amassed a fairly dedicated and devoted fan base. In 1921, he appeared in two movies, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and The Sheik. The films were big hits and established Valentino as a star, with a reputation for being an irresistible romantic heartthrob. Male writers implied in Photoplay magazine and in the pages of the Chicago Tribune that Valentino was gay. More than likely, though, they were jealous of his undeniable magnetism. They even went as far as labeling him a pink powder puff. Valentino tried his best to counter these rumors by giving a fiercely athletic and intensely masculine performance in 1926's The Son of the Sheik. After leaving the premiere in New York City, he was bombarded by fans who tore his clothing. It looked like Valentino was destined for fame and fortune, but two weeks after the film's debut, he collapsed from a ruptured appendix. He was rushed to surgery, but his health took a sudden turn and he fell into a coma. Not long after, he passed away. More than 100,000 mourners grieved on the streets outside the place Place where his body was being held. The situation became so chaotic that NYPD were called in to help restore order. Valentino's untimely death at age 31 meant the world would never know whether he would have successfully staged a transition from silent films to talkies. John Wayne was given his stage name at a meeting he wasn't at. The man who would eventually become legendary film star John Wayne got his start working as a prop boy and an extra for the Fox Film Corporation. He eventually climbed the ladder and started landing bit parts before he was cast in his first lead role in 1930's The Big Trial. The director of that film, Raoul Walsh, wanted a relatively unknown actor capable of bringing life to the gritty, unrefined world of the old Wild West. The actor who eventually went by John Wayne was first noticed by Walsh when he was moving heavy furniture across a soundstage. Walsh was impressed by the warm and wholesome look on John's face. He also took notice of his physique, strength, and grace in his movements. He knew John was his man, but there was one problem. At the time, this budding young actor was named Marion Morrison, and having a macho Western male lead named Marion wasn't going to fly. So Walsh and the head of the studio, Winfield Sheehan, had a meeting where they came up with the name John Wayne, in part because Sheehan idolized the American Revolution general Anthony Wayne and because the name had a suitable masculine ring to it. The Marx Brothers earned their nicknames at a card game in 1914. 
The Marx Brothers are so inseparably associated with their stage names that very few people actually know what their real names are. In case you're wondering, Groucho was Julius, Chico was Leonard, Harpo was Arthur, Gummo was Milton, and Zeppo was Herbert. There was also a sixth brother, the firstborn, named Manfred, but he passed away as an infant. Apparently, their famed aliases were given to them at one of their good friend's card games. Groucho claimed in his memoir that the brothers received their nicknames on May 15, 1914, although that date has been contested. The young vaudevillian brothers were evidently playing a game of poker backstage in Galesburg, Illinois, after giving a performance. Art Fisher, one of their fellow vaudevillian friends, had a fifth seat and dealt a new hand while dishing out nicknames as he went around the table. Arthur earned his nickname of Harpo because he was a self-taught harpist. Leonard was a lover of the ladies, so he was bestowed by the nickname Chico. Milton was especially fond of galoshes, or gumshoes as they were sometimes called, so that earned him the name Gummo. Julius was given the name Groucho, probably because of his short temper. Herbert, on the other hand, already had his nickname Zeppo since around 1900. The first Hollywood spoof of Hitler was a Three Stooges film. Tinsel Down's relationship with Nazi Germany before Pearl Harbor was a particularly challenging one. Film producers, especially Jewish ones, had more than enough reason to hate the Nazis. But America had not yet declared war with them, and it wasn't particularly good for business to poke fun at the government of a huge foreign market. You don't want to alienate your audience, so with few exceptions, the film industry did best to tread lightly in the early 30s when it came to lampooning the German fascists. Charlie Chaplin famously spoofed Hitler in The Great Dictator, which hit theaters in October of 1940. The Three Stooges, however, beat Chaplin to the punch nine months earlier when they released their own Third Reich parody in January of that year. The 1940 film You Nazi Spy depicted the comic trio as dense wallpaper hangers who got installed as dictators of the nation of Moronica. The business bigwigs who elevated them to their positions thought they were dumb enough to be easily controlled and manipulated. Moe played the Hitler-esque leader. Curly portrayed Field Marshal Gallstone, a character who seemed to be a hodgepodge of Goering and Mussolini. Larry was propaganda minister Pebble, who was a clear parody of Goebbels. Of course, the Stooges got themselves into all kinds of shenanigans and trouble in the movie. At the end of the film, however, the trio of dictators get deposed and eaten by lions. A sequel film called I'll Never Heil Again was released in 1941. Hollywood's first star was Canadian, and her name remained an industry secret. The first film star's name was Florence Lawrence, but a shockingly low number of people back in her time knew it. Throughout the industry, she was simply known as the Biograph Girl. Lawrence was born in Hamilton, Ontario to a vaudevillian family. She moved to the U.S. and started acting in the burgeoning motion picture industry. By 1908, she was regularly working with Biograph films and appeared in dozens of short films directed by the trailblazing director D.W. Griffith. Fans referred to her as the Biograph Girl because she wasn't credited by her real name in those shorts. Back in those days, producers didn't want actors to gain that sort of fame because they feared they would inevitably insist upon being paid more money. In 1910, Lawrence jumped ship and signed on with Carl Lemley's independent motion picture company. Lemley celebrated his newly acquired star by organizing a huge publicity campaign that included finally giving Lawrence the credit she was owed using her real name. And like that, a modern film star was born. But Lawrence didn't end up becoming quite as rich as some of her successors like Mary Pickford and Charlie Chaplin. By the 30s, she was forced to rely upon bit parts offered to her out of a sense of charity by Hollywood mogul Louis Mayer. In 1930, Lawrence felt she had run out of options and ended up taking her own life. Now it's time to hear from you. Which of these stories stands out the most? Let us know in the comments section below. And before you go, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.